Hello, everyone. Hey, it's a packed house, so let's uh, keep it formal in here so we can stay on agenda. Um, my name is Don McPherson, and this is not Greg Rogie. Greg Rogie will be virtually joining us because I, I'm sure many of you have heard about the challenges in the supply chain in LA. What you may not have heard of is in Vancouver, Canada, we're having similar challenges with uh, floods that have recently washed out uh, both our rail as well as our highway infrastructure in the interior of the province. And given Greg's responsibility for the direct, being the director of land operations at the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority, uh, he was otherwise committed to, uh, to dealing with challenges there. So in the spirit of a hybrid environment for reInvent this year, Greg will be virtually joining us to give us an overview of the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority. And Renee Haru, who is one of our partners at Deloitte, uh, responsible for cloud architecture, is going to join me in today's session to give you an overview of the work that we've been doing over the past few years for the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority to help improve their supply chain, specifically around uh, container examination process, which I assure you, by the end of this session, you'll know way more than you ever wanted to know about container examination at ports. So with that, um, what we're gonna touch on today is just an overview of the port, which Greg will walk us through, uh, Digital Greg, and, uh, and then we'll go through the context for the work that we were engaged to deliver. We'll jump into the solutions that we've deployed to address some of the challenges and then give you a glimpse of, of where we're at and where we're going with this particular initiative. So with that, I will pass it over to Digital Greg to give you an explanation a little bit more about uh, what the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority is all about. Let me start by sharing some information about the port. The Vancouver Fraser Port Authority is responsible for the stewardship of the federal port lands in and around Vancouver, British Columbia, located in a naturally beautiful setting on Canada's west coast. The port is financially self-sufficient and independent, yet accountable to the Federal Minister of Transport and operates pursuant to the Canada Marine Act. The Port of Vancouver is Canada's largest port and the third largest in North America by tons of cargo and the most diversified port in North America, facilitating trade between Canada and more than 170 world economies. The Port Authority, port terminals and tenants are responsible for the efficient and reliable movement of goods and passengers by integrating environmental, social and economic sustainability initiatives into all areas of port operations. We enable the trade of approximately $240 billion in goods, and port activity sustained about 115,000 jobs, $7 billion in wages, and almost $12 billion in GDP across Canada. Basically, one in three dollars of Canada's international trade travels through the Port of Vancouver. So pretty incredible in terms of how important this uh, little outlet on the west coast of Vancouver, or west coast of Canada, is for, uh, for our international trade. Greg mentioned in there that Vancouver Fraser Port Authority by tonnage is the third biggest port in North America. I was wondering if we could try and make this a bit interactive and see if anyone has any guesses in terms of what number one and two might be in terms of uh, similar ports in North America. Shaq, any thoughts? LA, that's what you said, that's what I said, that's what you said. Anyone else, any guesses? Yeah. Long Beach, good guess, also thought the same thing. Greg's a tricky guy, so he used wording which was around tonnage. And so the answer is actually South Louisiana at 238 uh, million tons, then Houston, then Vancouver, then uh, New York and New Jersey. So it's a port that ships not only a lot of containers, which LA Long Beach would be right at the top of that list if we were talking about just what's called TEU or, uh, or containers, uh, but Vancouver ships a lot of different commodities, so grain, potash, coal. Uh, not that's, that's Canada's dirty little secret, so maybe I'll just move on and not talk about coal exports. <laughs> um, so Greg will tell us a little bit more about the landscape around Vancouver and, and uh, the port's operations. The Port Authority's mandate is to facilitate Canada's trade objectives, ensuring goods are moved safely while protecting the environment and considering local communities. The Port of Vancouver has a large and complex jurisdiction spanning across 16 municipalities and traditional territories of more than 20 Indigenous First Nations. To give you a sense for our size, the Port of Vancouver is about the same size as the next five largest Canadian ports. And combined, we manage 16,000 hectares of water, 1,500 hectares of land, and more than 350 kilometers of shoreline. We are home to 28 major terminals across the entirety of the lower mainland of British Columbia. From one corner of our operations to the other, it's about 50 kilometers in distance, 
which gives rise to logistics, supply chain, and traffic challenges. We handle the most diversified range of cargo in North America, including bulk containers, brake bulk, liquid bulk, automobiles, and crews. The port's mission is to be the world's most sustainable port. By removing bottlenecks along transportation corridors, we aim to reduce traffic congestion and carbon emissions while freeing up new trade capacity for Canadian businesses. So 50 kilometers from one end to the other. So um, using my math, that's about three miles. Um, but it's a pretty big space. That was intended to be funny, but I guess it wasn't. I'll keep trying. Um, so <laughs> massive space, uh, lots of congestion around Vancouver, uh, and increasing demand, increasing volume of, of goods moving through there. This is the last Greg slide, and then Renee and I will, uh, will take over. But Greg here frames a little bit about the business problem that we'll be talking about. In 2017, we were experiencing significant challenges around our container examination process. For safety, security, and commercial reasons, a large number of containers coming into Canada need to be examined before they move on to their final destination. This process was taking longer and longer. We heard across a broad range of our stakeholders about their concerns related to the examination process, introducing variable costs and lengthy timelines into an otherwise fixed cost and fixed timeline supply chain. We were nearing the completion of a new state-of-the-art examination facility, but we still had not, still had limited data on what was happening within this process and were not able to pinpoint the source of the bottlenecks we were observing. We became aware of some of the ports around the world leveraging blockchain technology to enhance their tracking of containers and engage Deloitte to support us in building our own container visibility platform with a focus on the examination process. I'll pass it over now to Don to talk you through where that project started and where it has taken us. Why, thank you, Greg. <laughs> uh, so, as Greg mentioned, the port at this point in 2017 had spent about 12 years in collaboration with Canadian Border Services Agency, uh, the, the terminals around Vancouver, and others in building this state-of-the-art facility. They had spent over $20 million on this facility that was designed for the sole purpose of supporting the examination of containers. Containers that have been flagged by CBSA as potentially of concern for contraband, for drugs, guns, what have you, uh, for uh, non-declared trade items, prohibited items, all of that kind of stuff. But they were about to drop this facility into an ecosystem where none of the parties talked to one another, there was no data in terms of what was happening, and if there was one thing that was clear, it was a broken system. So when we started this, we went out and did uh, stakeholder engagement sessions, and everyone was not only positive that it was everyone else's fault, but they actually had done their own reports. And all of them came forward with these reports that said, it's someone else's fault. We are performing exactly as expected, and the next person in this supply chain is, is the one who's creating bottlenecks. So we had to get to the bottom of that. We started by creating a governance structure, getting these entities around a table and having a conversation. But there was a lot of heat in the room because of the complaints around this. So there had been a lot of industry engagement uh, with CBSA and the port, how can we do better? And it kept coming back to this pain point. The container examination process is So the port actually does believe in customer service and you kind of try and understand what was this process like? And I was trying to think, how am I gonna explain this to you other than an eye chart up here? And I was thinking about in terms of air travel, I think we all, probably everyone here, either flew here or has flown in the past. And so what the equivalent of this is, is about one out of every 20 times you'd take a flight, your bag would be sequestered for examination. Okay, that seems reasonable. I think I go to the airport pretty often, probably about one out of every 20 times I travel, my bag does get separated out. But this time, Instead of your bag just being opened in front of you, they back up one of those little airport golf carts and they throw the bag on the back and they drive it to the other side of the airport. You don't see your bag, it's gone. And you're left there wondering, when am I gonna get my bag back? You're waiting and your bag's gone off to this separate facility where now someone's gonna look at it when they have time. It's at the back of a line of a lot of bags and so they get to it and they open up your bag, they, they find that there's nothing in there they put your bag back and they wait for the golf cart to come and get your bag again. Take it back to you. And so you're left there, a couple hours later your bag comes back, you've missed your next flight. Not only does this sort of represent the customer service at the airport, 
but they hand you an invoice at the end that says, here's the charges for the golf cart. Here's the charges for the labor for someone to open your suitcase and put it back in. So you put yourself in the, the, the viewpoint of shippers and ocean carriers, and it was a lot of stress because for them, it wasn't hundreds of dollars. These examinations were costing between five, and there were examples that they were over $50,000 to go through a process that you have no control over, has all these variable timelines, often took more than 20 days for the examination to be completed. And as we were starting the project, one of the entities that I talked to was the Canadian Association of Produce Providers. And so they said, listen, if you're in the business of selling plastic trees, a three-week delay, not a big deal. But if you sell bananas and there's a three-week delay, you've got some problems. You're ending up with a container full of stinky bananas that you can't use. And so for them, this is something they were really, really passionate about fixing. So the port engaged us to look at this, help solve the problem, bring some data to the table, and, and uh, create a more efficient process. So what you'll see here is on the left, CBSA initiates this process based on their threat intelligence. They identify that there's a container of risk, a container of interest. So they send a, a message to the terminal operator, in this case a company called GCT, which puts in their terminal operating system, when this container arrives, we need to separate it out. So the container goes to a separate area. It's then available for pickup. The drayage company or trucking company then needs to make a reservation, which might not be available for a week or so. And so they finally come, pick up the container, drive it back to this facility that's four and a half kilometers away from the terminal. They take all the goods out of the container once they get to it. They look at it. Typically, there's no concerns inside. They put everything back in. They make the container available again. There's another reservation. There's another trip uh, to bring the container back. As I mentioned before, the, the uh, sort of chef's kiss of the process is an invoice that you get that you have to pay before the container can be delivered to, uh, to the beneficial cargo owner. So we, we looked at this process, and uh, we actually it, we leveraged the blockchain platform to build uh, an end-to-end -end supply chain visibility um, uh, private blockchain platform that would allow us to track the movement of containers from the other. And we built smart contracts at key points throughout to allow for releases, allow for the immutable sort of definitive identification that the container had passed from one party to the next. So we were all effectively, through the, the system and the data and the way it had been built, agreeing that this is what happened when, in terms of the life cycle. So that brought us some clarity in terms of what was actually happening. Um, but there were challenges with the platform. It was a pilot initiative, worked pretty well. But the challenge that we were left with is that at the container examination facility, we were still reliant on manual data entry from CBSA, from the labor provider organization. And so just entering that data into the system a couple of days after the container had actually left the facility. So we're dealing with latency. We're dealing with delays in the accuracy of data uh, that we wanted to address. And so we started conversations with the port in terms of how can we automate the collection of data? How can we make it more real time? We explored things like RFIDs, QR codes, where we could attach things to the container. We could know where they were and track their movement around. But adding something else to the container to, to automate the process didn't make much sense, because you're actually now introducing a physical process into something that you're trying to streamline. So as we were looking for ways to automate the process, we connected with AWS and started to explore how their new Panorama Computer Vision at the Edge platform would allow us to track the location of the container uh, as it moves around the facility. So computer vision at the edge also had a lot of other benefits. Not only the fact that you wouldn't deal with the issues around large volumes of uh, camera feeds going into the cloud and therefore expensive storage and processing costs, but also doing the processing right at the edge in the panorama device where you're not storing the data had security benefits from a data residency standpoint. It also had privacy benefits because the unions involved with this were interested in their images sitting in being stored in the cloud. 
So lots of sort of additional benefits that were specifically relevant in the context of, of this example. So with that, maybe Renee, I'll pass it over to you and you can give an overview of, uh, of what we built and how we built it. Absolutely, thanks Don. So the solution overview that we built for the port, we developed a platform that will allow for the identification of the containers, extraction of the container ID, and the ability to localize the container at any point along its journey through the container examination process. The data captured through the computer vision is then sent to the blockchain platform, but the image data itself is not retained. We were able to leverage the port's existing IP camera infrastructure for rapid scaling of this platform, all the while providing higher quality data in a more timely manner for the port to help improve the throughput of the container examination process itself, as well as the overall trust in the examination process across all the stakeholders that Don had mentioned before. Um, and then now just to get into the solution architecture for you guys. Starting from the top left there, we, we sourced images from various video and image data sets, uh, as well as live feed from the port itself to develop the algorithm to identify the color of the container, the container ID, the Smart Logistics Machine Learning Pipeline uses a wide variety of training data and uses Amazon SageMaker to train a custom object detection model for our specific use case. The model is also optimized to run effectively on the edge computing device with memory compute limitations before it's deployed on the Panorama appliance itself. Um, the Panorama, Panorama appliance is installed on the client's secure network and connected to a network of IP cameras. We install multiple panorama appliances throughout the port, depending on the total number of cameras required to be connected. Uh, the setup has a one to three ratio. Um, the Smart Logistics Computer Vision module, which detects, identifies, tracks, and localizes the shipping containers at the client site, is then packaged and deployed to the panorama appliance using a Docker container, not an actual container. Um, once the application is deployed, uh, the Panorama appliance uses AWS's IoT Greengrass platform and IoT Core to transmit the video data analytics data that includes the camera, uh, sorry, container ID, the camera ID, and a timestamp using MQTT via HTTPS connections, uh, and that hits our AWS Smart Logistics AWS instance that you see at the, on the bottom there. Um, the data from MQTT is streamed into the Dynamo DB SQL, NoSQL database. The Panorama appliance, it does not store any visual data at all, as that was one of the, one of the key concerns from the port. Uh, and it does, and it, but it does transmit the container ID, uh, the timestamp, as well as the camera ID. The Smart Logistics backend service includes a NoSQL database and APIs to push data to the other related systems. And it also has a web app through which some of these analytics can be consumed through various dashboards we've developed. The Smart Logistics API can be used to request container tra tracking data from first or third party systems, like our Deloitte blockchain solution that Don mentioned before, or to organizations such as Salesforce based CRM systems, like a third party integration. Um, and with that, I'll hand it back to Don to, to talk to the next slide. Thanks, Renee. No problem. So what you see here is a, an aerial view of what the examination facility uh, in question looks like. You'll see the deployment of, of the cameras that, uh, that we use. So there were some existing uh, port and CBSA cameras, but uh, for the purpose of the pilot, we did also install our, our own cameras. Uh, through collaborating with Axis, and someone from Axis is here today, which I'm super excited about. Uh, Axis was a great uh, organization to bring into this process, as was Convergent, which was a security integrator that we engaged. The two organizations, Axis and Convergent, had both worked with CBSA in the port in the past, and Deloitte is good at many, many things, but installing cameras or building <laughs> cameras, not so much. So uh, the importance of having strong alliances like Axis and Convergent gives us confidence, not only the fact that we can help the port, but for any client, whether or not you have an existing camera footprint or not, uh, that we can come in and, and help with those end-to-end -end implementations for, uh, for Panorama 
and uh, other computer vision use cases. You'll see itty bitty dots there as well, which is, uh, this is an early screenshot of some of the dev work that we did where um, what that's reflecting is the dwell time of those containers. They're at bay doors, and the question is how long have they been there? So starting to build out some of the visuals of what would, what would the visual cues be uh, in terms of how long the container's been there uh, in order to, uh, to flag if, if uh, perhaps something needs to move. Um, so again, queuing the, the operations team. So with no further ado, I will show you what this looks like uh, live. So this is an actual, uh, the panorama device and the algorithm that we developed. What you're not looking at is a camera from the facility that, that, uh, that I just showed you. It's a secure facility and CBSA is very concerned about how we use the images from it. Uh, so this is another feed that we received, but the algorithm and everything you're about to see is, uh, is actually running on the panorama devices. So you'll see that the truck is picked up, the algorithm picks out the container, and you can see that it's, it's pulling out the IDs of the containers. It's also providing the color of the containers uh, as sort of metadata to help us track if a container perhaps gets obscured behind another container on the lot. We can start to use metadata to come up with levels of, uh, of confidence around whether or not we're looking at the same container. You can also see on the right, there's a, a, a confidence threshold as well at the bottom right that dynamically assesses and, and provides um, us input into the confidence level around the accuracy of the container ID. So this is what we've built. We're very excited about this work and working with AWS and, and specifically around the Panorama device and working with the Panorama team. AWS has been incredible to work with. We've got to work with people right around the world, both on the Deloitte side, Deloitte side as well as the AWS side. And despite the fact that we're starting with containers, there's tons of use cases, not only at the port, but obviously elsewhere uh, that, that are endless in terms of how computer vision can be deployed. The port's currently looking at scaling this across their operations to help them uh, with things like tracking hazardous materials, so containers that, uh, that are flagged as containing hazardous materials, how can they be tracked differently? Uh, supporting them in terms of decarbonization. You heard Greg mention that the port's ambition or vision is to be the world's most sustainable port. So things like idle times for trucks and, and tracking how long trucks are in certain places are all part of the decarbonization initiatives that the port is looking at. So lots of different use cases. Safety would be the last one that I mentioned. Okay, I have one more, security. Uh, which is looking to track when people uh, approach containers or are interacting with containers flagged for examination and perhaps tampering with them. Once a container's flagged for examination, it's a pretty good time if you know that there's contraband in the container to pull it out. And so how you monitor at the terminal for tampering and, and things that uh, might occur there are all cases that we're exploring with both the port and Canadian Border Services Agency in terms of where computer vision can be deployed. Uh, so I know we're a bit ahead of time, but I do want to thank both AWS for their support for us in this project right from the beginning where the blockchain platform that I mentioned sits uh, in AWS and right through uh, the, the introduction of Panorama, supporting our team in, in building out the algorithms within Panorama. Uh, and I'd also like to thank the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority for their continued appetite to innovate and work with Deloitte on cool projects like this. So with that, I think we have some time. Uh, I don't know if we can do questions, but I'm happy to take them. It's not a, not a big group, so if we want to break up, I know Renee and I will stick around for a while, uh, but really appreciate everyone joining us today and letting us share with you the work that we've been doing in Vancouver. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>
the, the, uh, the blockchain platform and what we use it for. So I mentioned that there's aspects of releases that need to occur throughout the life cycle of containers, so throughout the examination process, uh, and that there's payment. So we are looking, in the initial uh, implementation, it was to use smart contract functionality to document when it was handed, sort of a, train, uh, a trail of custody as it's handed from one party to the next. But we were then, the plan is that we would scale it into looking at uh, automating payments, leveraging smart contracts, and automating releases, leveraging smart contracts and the data that we have in the systems. It's called Quorum. Uh, it's, it's, uh, um, it's a publicly available um, blockchain platform that really focuses on the smart contracts aspect, and that's why we selected it. Cool. Okay. Well, thank, thank you, everyone. We're going to stick around if there's any questions. So appreciate your time.